Uh, Dr. DeMaria will lead Dr. Gersh and Dr. Zire through a discussion on a new approach to delivering stem cell therapy for patients with CHS. Now, Dr. Anthony N. DeMaria founded the Sulpizio Family Cardiovascular Center at the University of California in San Diego. His field of specialization is cardiac imaging techniques, particularly echo cardiac Dr. DeMaria is currently the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology and has served as an editorial consultant and member of various other editorial boards. And he has authored or co-authored over 530 articles for medical journals. Uh, Dr. Bernard J. Gersh is a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine, a consultant in cardiovascular diseases and internal medicine, and associate chair of academic affairs and faculty development in the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Gersh's wide interests include the natural history and therapy of acute and chronic coronary artery disease, clinical electrophysiology, uh, and in, in particular, atrial fibrillation and sudden cardiac death, uh, cardiomyopathies and clinical implications of molecular genetics in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cardiac stem cell therapy, and the epidemiology of cardiovascular disease the in the field, developing the whole world. Field. And then finally, Dr. Yes. Andreas M. Zeyer is professor of medicine at the University of Frankfurt. His research interests include basic and clinical aspects of vascular biology and atherosclerosis, uh, the role of stem and progenitor cells for endogenous cardiovascular repair, as well as their therapeutic application for regenerating cardiovascular function and uh, the use of biomarkers for risk prediction and therapeutic stratification of patients with acute coronary syndromes. So ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to bring to our stage doctors Demaria, Gersh, and Zire. Please help me welcome them. Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks very much. And thank them in the back for turning my microphone on early. <laughs> so, uh, good morning. Obviously, uh, a stem cell therapy is very, very exciting. Uh, you know, I often say we, we can put stents into occluded arteries, we can put defibrillators in, we can replace heart valves, but the one thing we can't do is replace uh, dead muscle. And so that represents the allure of, of cell therapy in general. And, uh, and that's why so many people working so hard to make it a reality. But what, what we're all going to talk about this morning are some of the issues relating to cell therapy for cardiovascular disease. So maybe I could begin, Andreas, by saying, do we have a cell? Is there a perfect cell that's been identified uh, uh, that we can use to transplant? Well, the clear-cut answer until now is no, we don't, because we don't have a cell which actually transforms to a cardiac myocyte. So what we currently believe is using a different sources of cell types, that they mainly act via paracrine mechanisms, releasing factors, but thereby enhancing the endogenous repair capacity, which nature has obviously invented for our heart, at least for minute damages, and this is the current concept. But at the time being, I think there are many, many efforts to make the cells we do have available more functional, more potent. Um, one has to say we are in the very early stage of this field. There have been expectations raised, which might have been uh, a little bit too far. Uh, so we went back and, and concentrated on what we have. Um, but as you said, I think the goal of finding cells which really can regenerate the heart in a biological function clearly is an outstanding goal, and it's an absolute need for that. So I'm a little bit optimistic that in the future we will find a cell, but at the time being, I think we mostly repair 
the heart by stimulating endogenous regeneration processes. Yeah. So uh, assuming, Bernard, that that's what we're doing, is there a preferable cell? Uh, 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 are we using bone marrow cells, or, or do you think uh, immune-protected uh, cells, IPS I, I, cells? I, I think this is one big, really, a question mark. I mean, the, I think of stem cell therapy as we've gone through the very first phase, which has taken about 10 years. And that's been dominated by bone marrow stem cells. And if you look at the trials, they all, they're all modestly positive. But what you see is the trend is always in the right direction. Even in terms of clinical events, Dr. Zayas, Andre, Andreas's trial, which was not powered for clinical events, but everything is in the right direction. Now, on the downside, now the other uh, positive finding is it's been safe and it's feasible. The downside is the cells don't survive. If you go back a week later, they're gone. And yet you see these benefits, and that, that has led to the paracrine hypothesis that Andreas talked about. So now as we go into the next phase, there are a, a, a large number of candidates, resident cardiac stem cells, adipose tissue-derived mesenchymal stem cells, guided mesenchymal stem cells, and then this whole question of induced pluripotent cells, which I think is still very, very much investigational, not tested clinically. So we've got these new cells that look promising, but the clinical trials are very small to date. And I think um, the results remain to be determined. But if these cells are an improvement, and if they remain in the myocardium, and they proliferate, and they regenerate, the entire safety issues will have to be revisited again. Because well, I mean, one reason why it's so safe maybe because the cells don't stay very long. Yeah, I'm being it, a bit skeptical, but or, or cynical, but I, I think that's still an issue. Yeah, it's been so vexing, hasn't it? I mean, embryonic stem cells, uh, you would think, would be the best. That's where we all came from, but they're tumorogenic, and uh, and clearly there are some uh, ethical issues. Uh, the bone marrow cells, uh, I think we all agree, are at best paracrine and maybe angiogenic, maybe anti-apatotic, but probably not truly regenerative and and perhaps these cardiac cells you know we've we've all been taught that myocardial cells are terminally differentiated but we've all got in us somewhere at least a few uh, cardiomyocytes that have stem cell potentials uh, the perfect cell yet, yet to be found I mean it is interesting that um, we actually have stem cells that proliferate. I, I think it's 0.5 to 1% of our cardiac cells turnover per year. More, about 1% in younger people, 0.5% in older people. So the potential to regenerate is there. If one could harness the cells and understand, understand them and maybe accelerate their, um, their potential to replicate, uh, I mean, uh, the mechanism is there. It's tantalizing. It's out yeah. of reach, though. And, and, of course, there are stem cells in trials. There have been stem cells in previous trials, and there are trials going on. As a matter of fact, my friend to my right <laughs> is running uh, a big trial. So, uh, uh, Andreas, given the cells that we have available, what's the best way to give them? Can, can, can we give them yeah. intracoronary, or are we going to have to stick them in the myocardium? Yeah, first of all, it, it's simply depending on what you want to treat, both the, the route of application as well as potentially the cells. Because if you have a patient with an acute myocardial infarction, what we want to interfere with is the healing process. And maybe thereby it's sufficient to use bone marrow derived cells, which do not become cardiac myocytes, but uh, affect the inflammatory processes as you said, to release factors which are protective for the cardiac myocytes and thereby modify the healing process and prevent what we call adverse remodeling, thereby prevent enlargement of the heart after the infarction. And this might be sufficient actually to have a major clinical impact. In addition, in the acute myocardial infarction setting, I think the intracornary route of application is clearly the way to go because first it's safe. Second, in the infarcted myocardium, there are cytokines 
sky high upregulated, which attract the cells out of the circulation, and thereby you get at least 5 to 10 percent of the cells you infuse into the target area. It's a completely different picture if you have a chronically remodeled heart in a patient, let's say five, six years after a large heart attack, because there's no inflammation, there's scar tissue, there's rarification of the vasculature. In this case, and there's no signals for the cells to go there. Why should the cell infused into the coronary artery stick to a scar tissue and do some potential beneficial effects in the surrounding tissue? So in this case, I think we uh, have to look for alternative routes of application, like the intramyocardial injection using a catheter where you go retrograde through the aorta and then into the ventricular cavity and inject the cells. This has the problem that you always get some heterogeneity in cell distribution and you really don't know where to inject the cells. There might be actually ways to precondition the target tissue. We did a small trial using shock waves, which you all you use for renal destruction as an unspecific activation of the target tissue, and this leads to upregulation of the same cytokines which are upregulated during hypoxia, and this leads to an increased retention of cells. Uh, a completely different issue is patients with non-ischemic heart failure. Obviously, obviously there we have no idea what would the best way to infuse the cells. So I think at the time being, the, the, the answer would be yes, in acute myocardial infarction, go via the transcornary route of application. In chronic heart failure, look for more efficient techniques to well, apply the worth, cells. It's worth pointing out that there are two trials with clinical endpoints that have been, very, that have been positive. One is a trial done by um, Douglas Sordo, who used to be at Northwestern, yes. is now at Baxter, in people with refractory angina. Angina who are non-revascularizable candidates. And there's a, there is a significant improvement. It's 187 patients. It's not that small a trial. A significant improvement in symptoms. And he has also shared with me data he's presented that are currently in press in people with peripheral vascular disease, where there's a reduction in amputation. And so one, one concept, I, I, I don't know if you'll buy this, but one concept is if there's ischemia, post-myocardial infarction patients, people with angina, people with peripheral vascular disease, maybe bone marrow cells that can elaborate angiogenic properties or endothelial progenitor cells may be um, the way to go. Whereas in dilated cardiomyopathy, um, it may be a completely different set of cells, yes. maybe cardiac stem cells that regenerate muscle. So I don't think it's just regenerating muscle. I think the paracrine effects on angiogenesis and maybe apoptosis may be extremely, extremely important and we yes. may have different okay. sets of cells for different conditions. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's true. It's interesting because we were participating in Doug's trial and we've done some other trials and I have to tell you out there, for those of you who plan to get involved yourself, uh, as, as Andreas was saying, the trials we've done, the patients we've treated, to identify the target area where you want to put your cells, we've done this NOGA mapping, electromechanical mapping, and then used the transendocardial needle to inject the cells directly into myocardium. I must, I must tell you, as a non-interventionalist, I find this, you know, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't go quickly. <laughs> Uh, this is not smooth and, and whatnot. So as we go forward, uh, it's probably going to be very important to, uh, to determine if there's ways we can stimulate the myocardium or select cells for specific conditions so we, uh, we can facilitate the administration. I think what's, what's fortunate is all of this is taking place upon a background of incredibly sophisticated molecular imaging. I mean, this is a technology that is really moving along. And I have a, I think there's pretty good grounds for optimism that these techniques will enable people to track the cells and really understand what happens to them and where they go. And it may be, and I like so many new innovative technologies, it, it requires other technologies that are developing to bring out the best of both. And 
Uh, I think this is a very exciting field. We have people working on that. And yeah, it's really amazing, isn't it, that here we are delivering cells. You know, Andreas has treated hundreds of patients. We, we, we treated less than 100. But we have no idea where the cells actually go, where, yes. whether they stay there or not, and we don't have a, a means of identifying where they are, if they're still alive, and if they're active. Yep. Yes. We need to do that better, don't we? Uh, yep. I think that's going to happen. I, well, think, the, I think that is going to happen. There, there is some, some potential uh, clinical applicable uh, technique actually to lay cells with a fluorescent dye, which is coupled at the uh, being live because otherwise the enzyme would, would not function. Uh, there is some uh, testing this in patients with tumors to identify the activity yeah. of tumors. So, and if it turns out that the technique is going to be safe, it might actually be applicable to patients with heart disease too. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, thus far, uh, the signal that you get out it's very small. is not, not terribly strong. So if you're, if you're treating mice, then this is a very yes. good technique. Uh, the, the analogy yes. that I like is there's more computing power in my laptop than there was in the Apollo spacecraft. <laughs> this is a fact. And this is 30 years ago. So yeah, That's 30 okay. years ago. So you know, things move. Uh, things change. And stem cells won't uh, grow in isolation. You know, one thing is interesting. The trials, the last 10 years have been criticized because the change in ejection fraction is very modest. It's only 3 to 4 percent. Have you any idea what the change in ejection fraction was in the first trials of streptokinase? The overwhelmingly positive okay. trial that uh, started the whole re reperfusion era? 3 to 4 percent. And with the ACE inhibitors, the first four big ACE inhibitor trials, 3 to 4 percent. So if this 3 to 4 percent could become 10 percent in the next 10 years, we then have a very important therapeutic modality. That's and, the target. And in fact, it may not need to be much more yes. than 3 to 4 percent if it changes mortality. And by the way, I would say uh, that th that particular data that Dr. Um, uh, Gersh is referring to was published in Jack yes, uh, it was. as a yeah. review by Reffelman. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, <laughs> if, a very good journal, I would say. Uh, so, you know, but there have been a number of trials. There's, there's a lot of trial data out there. And what would you say about the trials? Have they been cautiously positive, negative, heterogeneous? Where, where do we stand at this uh, stage? Again, it, it depends on the, the indication. And if you, if you look for patients with refractory angina, more or less normal cardiac pump function, I think the overwhelming evidence is there are three absolutely positive trials. And Baxter just started a large trial here in the U.S., which is actually aiming at approval at the therapy. But this, this is obviously a very low-hanging fruit because what you have to change is anginal symptoms and you have to increase uh, duration of exercise, which might be possible, as Bernie said, simply due to the uh, uh, vascular effects of the cells. So I think if there will be an indication soon for clinical use, it will be the refractory angina patients. In the critical limb ischemia cohort, I think it's much more difficult because those patients have lots of comorbidities. Mostly of them are old and have diabetes. And we do know what we should not forget. In contrast to our animal experiments, the cells we obtain from sick patients are functionally severely impaired. So neither critical limb ischemia nor chronic heart failure stops in front of the bone marrow if you talk about bone marrow-derived cells. I think there might be the, the trials in acute myocardial infarction are extremely heterogeneous, the results. There have been positive trials, there have been intermediate trials, there have been two large trials which were completely negative. Uh, it might be in part related to cell processing and cell storage because this is completely different than using a drug. A drug you just take out of the box and, and you take it and you know the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics. Cells have to be treated 
ex vivo out of the body in a very careful way so that, that they don't lose their functionality. But if you put all acute myocardial infarction trials together, there's clearly a signal with respect to better clinical outcome, which now has to be tested long term. And there are some data showing that it might actually interfere with adverse remodeling. In the chronic heart failure, all trials are actually neutral. There is almost no signal in terms of uh, sustained improvement in pump function, with the exception of the two trials which just came out using cardiac-derived cells. But both of them are unblinded. They are not uh, placebo-controlled, so we have their small numbers. So I think in the chronic heart failure, which would be the most attractive patient population, we are at least uh, advanced in terms of having evidence that this might make a difference. Yeah. I, you know, it seems to me if this is going to work, that, uh, that the point you bring out, uh, we can either take cells off the shelf, yes. which is the classic way we deal with things, and, and that would obviously be best. There were cells on the shelf, and the patient came in and needed them, uh, the alternative is, is to take the patient's own cells, which presumably uh, eliminate the immune issues of rejection. But uh, uh, as Andrea said, we're taking cells from the sickest patients. Yes. And so it looks like we're getting the sickest cells. The, uh, uh, the presentation of the late-breaking clinical trial here a couple of days ago by the... Uh, uh, by the stem cell consortium here in the United States uh, was negative. Uh, Dr. Califf uh, indicated it was resoundingly <laughs> negative. <laughs> but I don't but, think it's quite as negative as Rob is saying. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think, Bernard, the, the thing ab that was very interesting was that when they analyzed the cells that they were actually transplanting, the percentage of cells that they had that were, were, were really those with stem cell characteristics, CD34, were surprisingly few in number, and, and, and frankly, they were kind of uh, uh, puny. Well, I, I was involved with a very small trial that was published about two years ago, where we were able to look at the cells in response to, I think it is stromal-derived Growth, growth factor, factor. Which, and, and the cells could be categorized by their migration in terms of in, in the presence of this growth factor. And even in this small trial, if we looked at those cells that were, quote, healthy, the results were positive, really positive. In those that weren't, there was no benefit. And so one whole new area, there is a trial now ongoing in Canada where the cells are rejuvenated by overexpressing ENOS, nitric oxide symptoms. And I think you, your group, Andreas, has yeah. been interested in that, and that is taking these cells from diabetic, hypertensive, smoking, older patients and rejuvenating them, them um, and then giving them back, because it does have the advantage that there are no immunological problems, issues, as there may be with yes. using someone else's cells. I mean, you've, you've yes. got a number of uh, yes. techniques that... That's, that's what we are currently mainly focusing on, in, at least in patients with chronic heart failure, as I said before, to optimize the cells. And since you have them out of the body, you have them in your tissue culture system, you can treat them with various substances. Wonderful example, if you put statins in the cell culture, the cells definitely get better. Statins uh, act as pro-survival kind of signaling. So this is one way, but there are other small molecules and other things uh, which you can actually put into the cells and then wash it away so you don't have to infuse the substance. But the point you made about the, and, and you, Tony, between the association between cell functionality and what we see as clinical readout in terms of measurement, in my view, this is very encouraging because this actually points towards, yeah. let's say, a cause and effect uh, mm -hmm. kind of relationship mm -hmm. because if we have better functional cells, we see more improvement in function. I think this is more or less an indirect proof of concept that we are not going entirely in the wrong direction. I, I, I find that I very agree. encouraging to you. Yes. Now it makes sense. I, yes. I agree entirely. You know, if you do an experiment and, and the results are negative, well, that's a bummer. 
But on the other hand, if you find clues as to why it's negative and things you can improve on, then that's very encouraging. And that's, that's the way I read those results. You know, yes. one, one thing to bring home, which I, I, I think, again, is a source of optimism, is to make sure you understand the magnitude of the effort that is being put into this around the world. I mean, the amount of basic science that is ongoing is enormous. And when I say around the world, I mean around the world. We're collaborating with a group in, at the Fuwai Hospital in Beijing, China, who are doing incredibly sophisticated work. And this is, um, I know, this is not just a few isolated centers yes. that, are, that are interested. I mean, it's Europe, the States, it's all over. Yeah. I, w I would say if, if I had a message uh, for you out there for right now, I think that there are studies that have been positive, and I think that the follow-up studies that are going, if any of you from Europe, uh, uh, what you, you, it's not repair MI2, what, no, it, what is it? It's called BAMI, bone marrow derived cells in acute myocardial infarction. Yeah, BAMI, and, and the you know, there's a number of centers, I think 30 centers in the United States that are gonna be doing the refractory angina so that I, I think there's reason that you could very well refer patients to these studies and believe that, that the patients may benefit based yes. upon the available data. So where are we going? Uh, what do you see as the future for this field? Well, obviously, the most important thing is to bring this therapy to the patients, but to bring it to the patient, it has to be an approved therapy. So if we are confident that we, we do have an effect on clinical outcome and we can shoot for a, a trial going for approval, I think we should do. We have clear-cut safety data in acute myocardial infarction. There's absolutely no reason to believe it's, it's uh, unsafe for the patients. There's a clinical signal. So as I said, in the acute myocardial infarction patients, we have to show in a large clinical outcome trial that it reduces mortality and rehospitalization for heart failure, otherwise it will not be approved by the regulatory authorities. The, the first indication I foresee with the cells we currently have at hand, as I said, will be refractory angina because this, this is the low hanging fruit. And chronic heart failure, my personal view is let's go back to the bench and yeah. enhance the cells, enhance the retention, enhance and, and improve the uh, delivery techniques in order to make an impact or find more potent cells which then can do their job. Yeah, well, one of the things we're working on is, uh, is working with a biomatrix. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Karen Chrisman, who's an extraordinarily talented bioengineer, has developed uh, a biomatrix, a ground substance type material that's actually derived from the, the skeleton of, of, of the heart itself. And the idea that we can bolster the heart with that and incorporate stem cells so that they home and engraft more avidly is, is another. There's enormous approaches. Yes. Uh, Bernie, what, what, where's this field I, going? I, I, you know, I think cautious optimism. Uh, the question is, will it flourish or founder? And I think what we've seen is what happens with every new procedure. There's a period of euphoria, and then suddenly reality sets in, and then everybody's on Prozac, and the field is you know, doomed to extinction, and then you get a perspective. And, and what we are, I mean, this happened with drug-eluting stents. Remember the ESC firestorm? Five years ago, drug eluding stents. Six years ago, increased mortality and the use yeah. dropped 30% overnight in the States. So I think what we've had is a period of euphoria and hype, which is dangerous. And I think now there's a sense of reality in terms of people understand the barriers to success. And I think it's time for cautious optimism. I think what's important for all of us as physicians is to dampen down the hype and say this is a progressing field um, I agree with Andreas. I think that the low-hanging fruit is refractory angina. I'm really impressed with the data. We have a big trial in this area going on. Uh, heart failure, the chronic heart failure, I agree. Back to the drawing board, and that, that's further down the line. But you know, it's moving in a responsible direction. 
So I hopefully you've got an idea from this this panel of the state of the art and and where we're going. It's uh, there's an unusual degree of agreement here, <laughs> uh, which often is uh, is missing uh, among people in the field. But I hope this has been of some value to you, and and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.